one thing we keep talking about on this program, but I think we can't talk about it enough, is the systematic suppression of voter rights around this country and what it's doing to us as a democracy and as a society. Our next guest is, is part of an effort to do something about that, and we're going to talk about that now. Faz Shakir is the national political director of the American Civil Liberties Union, and they have a new initiative in this area. First of all, Faz, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, sir. I appreciate uh, you willing to bring me on. So tell us, what, what's the ACLU up to in this area? Well, you know, we've been on defense on voting rights for such a long time, and rightfully so, that we've seen voter assaults in the forms of voter ID bills in so many states. You know, prior to the election of President Obama, you had a roughly two states that had photo ID bills. And then after his election, after the Tea Party wave in 2010, you had roughly 19, 20 states come on board with 25 different laws that imposed so many obstacles to the ballot. And we've been fighting those in court, uh, many of which have been successful, quite frankly. But now the courts are starting to shift under President Trump. And it's just become a really critical time to go on offense and think about reforming our voting laws to make, them, make, peop make it easier for people to vote. Uh, and not since the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, I don't think we've had that kind of national grassroots action to expand voting rights. And that's partly because Congress is dysfunctional. So you're not going to get anything through Congress. And if you are going to succeed in this endeavor, you have to go state by state, state. And, you know, the ACLU is uniquely positioned in this regard. We've got 50 state affiliates. We've got a lot of resources, thanks to so many of the wonderful general public who's provided it to us, that I think it's incumbent upon us at this day and age and this time to go on offense and start reforming state laws to expand voting rights in our country. Well, I love the idea of going on offense, first of all, and I want to talk about that in a second. But first, I want to make sure that our listeners understand the magnitude of the problem. Uh, and you alluded to it a little bit earlier in terms of uh, ID laws, which uh, discriminate. And we can talk about the ways in which they discriminate uh, and the fact that they address what is essentially a non-existent problem. Uh, in fact, what is unambiguously, in my opinion, a non-existent problem of a supposed voter fraud. Uh, but I think it's also important. You know, you point out that uh, you guys have been uh, and uh, have been extremely successful in defending uh, voting rights in the courts against such laws. But I think it's also important for listeners to understand that. Uh, there's been a systematic effort here on the part of the Republican Party to deny uh, a Democratic president under his eight years uh, the ability to appoint judges, to delay, and so on, and that we now have, after eight years of George W. Bush and now Donald Trump, we have a lot of judgeships being filled, making it harder to uh, defend people's voting rights in court, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right, and it's going to get hard, uh, much harder. I mean, you look at uh, Wisconsin, where we've, we've been fighting photo ID bills in their circuit court, which was pretty well in our hands. Uh, it was going the right way. We've had some retirements there. Donald Trump's going to appoint a few people, and it's going to shift and remake that entire circuit and make it much harder to fight Scott Walker's attempts to impose new voter restrictions. I mean, you look at North Carolina, where we fought for years, really four years, on a on various voter suppression laws that they passed. And in fact, the circuit court ruled that when you looked at the cumulative evidence of what North Carolina was doing, it amounted to kind of targeting African-Americans with, quote, surgical precision. And I think that those kinds of laws uh, where we've been successful now risk um, being upheld because the courts are going to change over the next four years. And so as you were suggesting, you know, the architect of all this, by the way, is Chris Kobach, uh, who's the Kansas Secretary of State, and he's, been, he's the chair of the Trump's Voter Fraud Commission. And we're going to go into his backyard the Sunday night uh, in Kansas and uh, launch this initiative um, at uh, 6.30 Central Time, 7.30 Eastern. Uh, urge people to watch. Uh, it's going to be on ACLU.org, and, and you can check it out there. But that's we're, we intentionally picked his backyard because we're going to go and talk about the fact that this guy has been pushing all of these voter fraud myths for a very long time to try to disenfranchise people. Yeah, and just I mean, if I recall correctly, you know, they, they keep – 
raising the specter that people are uh, uh, voting uh, who shouldn't be voting. I, if I recall correctly, in a study that was done of a billion votes, they found something like, I don't know, 30, which is yeah. so, so infinitesimal statistically as to be non-existent. And in return, so they're writing laws. And again, you know, you're, uh, you're an attorney, you're, you're addressing this full time. So if I say anything wrong, please correct me. But again, so we have uh, uh, Republican legislators are writing laws, photo ID laws, to address a non-existent problem that disproportionately affect uh, minority and lower income voters who are less likely to have uh, the photo ID that's common, uh, create financial... And, and students. And so I think like yeah. the other thing here is that they have tried to say that there are all these people, the voter fraud myth, the only people voting uh, illegally, as you, as you suggested, that, that number amounts to very small to nil. But then you take that small to nil number and you say, how many did so intentionally, knowing that they were trying to defraud the system? And now you've got the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest number, like literally one or two people. Uh, because, you know, most of the people in that category did so unknowingly, like, oh, you know, I was in Arkansas and I uh, and I moved to Kansas and I hadn't, didn't re-register and I uh, happened to be back in Arkansas or, or it was in Kansas. So I, I voted there when I should have voted in Arkansas. They just didn't know, you know, and, and they were caught up in the system. Most people there's like no one who's doing so intentionally with the effort to defraud the system. And and because of this voter fraud myth. Chris Kobach has passed laws in various states that disenfranchise literally tens of thousands of people, including, as I was suggesting, students, because in doing so, they say, well, you can't use a student ID to vote. That's one of their uh, reforms. And so they make the barriers to obstacle that much higher uh, with the clear intent of what they're actually trying to accomplish, which is uh, disempowering people who they think will vote against them. You know, here's, and again, we're talking with Faz Shakir, who is the national political director of the ACLU. Uh, here's what, and as you begin your offensive on this, I think it's very I important to talk about this, Faz. Here's where I think if you talk to most voters, doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, I think most voters in this country believe in the principle of democracy. They, they should be rebelling at the idea of politicians of any party uh, preventing people from voting just because they don't like the way those people might vote. And, that, and yet that's exactly what's happening, and instead we, we get articles about this non-existent voter fraud problem. I mean, I suppose we have to alter the statistics now that it turns out that Jared Kushner uh, registered as a woman in the state of New York. I suppose they might count that too. But, but uh, non-existent problem, we're not talking about the real problem. How do we shift, b before we get to the specifics of, of how you're going in, how do we shift the conversation to the real problem, which is a systematic attack on our democracy? Yeah, I, and, and so that's why when I say we're going to go on offense, you know, it, it's a really hard and difficult task. You've got all these states with different various laws. And so you literally have to go one by one by one and, and say, what are we going to do in Florida? What are you going to do in North Carolina? What are you going to do in Indiana? And we've gone through that with literally every one of the ACLU affiliates in each of those states. And we have three buckets of work that we think we can play on offense in. One is this gerrymander problem. Like, let's fix this with independent commissions who redraw our lines and make our democracy more representative. Number two is what we call this election reforms. Let's let's put in place automatic voter registration, election day registration, so you can register and vote on election day. Let's put in more early votes, no excuse absentee voting, expand the ability of people to get access to the ballot. Number three is restore the rights of those who've been denied their right to vote, particularly ex-felons. After they serve their time, they've paid their debt to society, they should be uh, they should get their vote back. And in many states, including Florida, they are not able to. And so we are going on offense in all those places. Every state in the country will have a unique call to action based on their unique problem. And um, and we're going to have a plan. So like on Sunday night, you'll see like if you're from uh, Florida, you'd log on and say, oh, you know, what's my Florida plan? My Florida plan is to collect signatures uh, to get onto the ballot and change 
our state constitution to re-empower and re-enfranchise ex-felons, 1.5 million of them who've been denied the right to vote. We believe in second chances for people, and so we are going to collect signatures up until the end of the year, and then we're going to get onto the ballot in November of 2018 in Florida, and we're going to get 60% plus and change this injustice. That's fantastic. Um, Florida, of course, being such a critical state um, on the national level as well as for its own electing its own officials. Um, any other states of such a critical nature that you've targeted like that? Yes. I mean, we, we've got so many interesting calls to action here, Rich. We could just go through all of them, like if there's particular states you're interested in. But like, say, California, you know, I, I think like you look at blue progressive states. Is there anything that we can do there? And the answer is yes. So in California, you know, they they allow same day registration, but it only happens if you uh, if county election officials grant it to each polling location. So now we're going to have a bunch of activists who are going to go to their county elections offices and demand that every polling location in California be granted same-day registration. And that's going to be huge. We're going to have a bunch of policy wins, I think, there, because we're going to have wonderful activists. Uh, even a place like, let's say, New York, uh, who you think of as generally being progressive, but on this stuff, you know, they don't have election day registration. Mm -hmm. They don't have, you know, the early voting. And we're going to be pressing people for uh, to contact their state legislators and call for those kinds of reforms. You take a place like Utah, I mean, a dead red area, we're going to be trying to push a ballot measure to establish an independent redistricting committee, uh, commission. Um, you know, like uh, Ohio, you know, Ohio is an interesting place where, you know, we talked with it with our affiliate about it, and they said, you know, one of the things here is that all these people in jail can uh, sh and should be able to vote. And the only thing that's needed there is we need to set up policies and protocols between the county board of elections and jail officials that facilitate that happening. So we're going to be urging jail voting in Ohio, which would, you know, create tons of new votes for, for uh, to introduce and, and re-empower a lot of people. So th those are just a, a sample of, of, of the kinds of measures we'll be unveiling. Yeah, that sounds great. And again, uh, in fast, Shakir, I, I want to, you know, since you've been around uh, this world, uh, you know, a while, and I, you know, I respect your, your insights in this area, I, I want to get your thoughts on something that I always struggle with. When an issue is this critical and this important and you're running campaigns, I mean, I, we, we run campaigns, whether it's for referenda or, or other forms of actions, we educate in order to run the campaigns, but I also feel, it's kind of a philosophical question if you'll bear with me, I also feel that you campaign to educate, that each campaign is an opportunity to let people know what's happening if they don't know already, so that the impact of the campaign should be one, to succeed in its immediate goal, the referendum, and two, to, to increase public knowledge about the issue at, at hand. And I'm wondering if, if you feel that's working in this case. Uh, well, feel... we're just starting this effort. So the Let People Vote effort will begin on Sunday night. As I mentioned, we'll have a major live stream event. Uh, hopefully there'll be a million plus people who watch it. And I think we're going to walk through a nice program where we educate people about the problems that we've been facing, how we need to go on offense, the way in which you can do this, the way you can get engaged. We're going to talk about the Kobach Commission and the agenda that we're up against and, 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 and the efforts that they want to impose upon us uh, to res rest restrict and retract certain laws that are on the books. And, and so hopefully that'll begin an effort that we think of as a movement. And I, I, you know, I, pref I prefaced our conversation up front by saying, you know, it hasn't been a national grassroots movement to expand voting rights. And so we're in a movement mentality. And certainly that means activists taking action, but it also just means, as you suggested, raising the intellectual discourse the awareness and and the opportunities to think differently, you know, and to say, hey, oh, yeah, you know, we can actually do something. We can actually uh, change the playing field. We don't necessarily just have to see one story after another story after another story in our press about how people are getting disenfranchised and simply feel like there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely great, and I think it's so important. So where can people uh, go to find out more about what you guys are doing? 
So I, I, there's two. Uh, you can either go to ACLU.org on Sunday night uh, and watch this live stream there, or you can go to peoplepower.org. Peoplepower is one word, peoplepower.org, where you can find a house party near you. And, and if you if you go there, uh, we have 600 house parties all across America and all 50 states uh, already set up to watch this event. And so there's a good chance that there's somebody near you and you can go watch it with your friends and your neighbors and build some community through this endeavor as well. Okay, well, that sounds great. Uh, Faz Shakir, a uh, uh, national political director of the ACLU, uh, thanks for your uh, excellent work. You guys are, are, are ramping up in this area, and thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. I really appreciate your time.